Fantastic, as always. My name is Janice Murakitani, and on behalf of all of you, thank you. I want to thank you, Madam Speaker, for honoring us with your presence, for coming home to Glide. This is your first appearance since the passing of the Health Care Reform Bill. As a woman and a mother of a daughter, and for all women, I think, especially as we observe International Women's Millennium, <laughs> I want to thank you for your tireless efforts to include the excluded, especially those of us who have ovaries, as a pre-existing condition. You know what I'm talking about, right, ladies, as a pre-existing condition to deny us health insurance. And for all who are poor and marginalized, who are from qualifying from health care, thank you for your struggle for justice and access. I just wanted to acknowledge some of your friends and colleagues who are present this morning. Our Glide Board, of course, Chair Amy Errett, our staff, CEO Willis Selden, the Glide Clinic staff, and the beneficiaries of your helping us receive funding for our existence, for our expansion, and for our renovation that enables us to help thousands more. We're serving over 3,000 people in our clinic. Um, and Amazing. to also, we want to acknowledge our clinic partners, Catholic Healthcare West, University of, San, of California, San Francisco, and St. Francis Hospital, and of course your friends, uh, Senator Leno, <laughs> Assemblyperson. <laughs> Assemblyperson Amiano. Board of Supervisors, Bevan Dufty, Sophie Maxwell, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, forgive me if I've missed any of you, but on behalf of all of us, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I always follow Jan. <laughs> Smart, I'm, guy. Smart guy. <laughs> I met so Nancy I Pelosi so when I went to Washington one time and went by her office. And at that particular time, things were rough, like this particular time. But what she did was so grateful and gracious. She took me to where she worked, to the house. And I had the opportunity to just see some of the things that she had going and were getting ready to make go. She talked about her father, who was mayor of Baltimore, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I caught a grasp of all of a sudden of this woman, this woman, who undoubtedly had a vision and, and, and a destiny that was growing, that was emerging, that was meaningful and, and spiritual and soulful and compassionate. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
And I said, you know, Nancy's is going to go places one of these days. <laughs> one of these days, Nancy's is going to go. I didn't know she was going to go for all of it, you know. <laughs> But the important thing is that she represents us. Yeah. And we've known members of her family because they volunteer at Glide. Years, they started years ago volunteering at Glide helping to feed people and serve people with all sorts of, of, of marginal uh, diseases. But they worked here. They have been here. They know this place. They know the people. By the way, you don't have to be afraid to applaud. You know, don't, don't start a thank you. Now, you don't start out and then sound like you're going to stop real quick. <laughs> Finally, I just want to say that her family, she, I remember her when she was, uh, of course, uh, getting uh, the speakership award, when she was up uh, with the gavel in her hand, and she passed it on to the kids, and they kind of hit the hit. And I said then, uh-huh, Nancy is smart. <laughs> There'll be other little Nancys that will come along. <laughs> I want to bring to you now one that we love because she's compassionate. One uh, that, that has a grasp of uh, what we are doing and what the world is into. And one who will not let us down. And we must always find a way with her because she is with us. Nancy Pelosi! <laughs> I may not need that. Thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, Cecil, for your kind words. <laughs> And thank you, but more on that in a moment. I just want to first acknowledge the tremendous leadership of Cecil, Reverend Cecil Williams and Jan. Uh, over the years, they have been an inspiration to all of us. They have taught us a great deal, and we have learned so much about the urgency of their work, an effective way to get the job done, and a connection that they have to people that is really almost biblical in terms of, well, it is biblical. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, in, I, I thank them for the invitation to be here and thought that it was perfectly appropriate that on my first trip back to San Francisco following the passage of the health care bill, which was finally passed on Thursday night. And here it was. <laughs> that would be back here at Glide once again. I want to tell you a few things, but first I also want to acknowledge uh, Senator Leno, Sen uh, Assemblyman Amiano, Supervisors Maxwell and Dufty for being here. I want to say how to the members of the board, thank you for what you do for Glide. I want to acknowledge my colleague, and I'll be talking about her as we go along, Congresswoman Jackie Speer, who was so much a part of this tremendous victory. Um, I want a friend of one of my friends for many years, and she, uh, Phyllis Lyons' partner, Del Martin, the two of them were the first people, lesbian couple married in San Francisco. So here we are at Glide Memorial on this beautiful Palm Sunday, celebrating really something that is historic in terms of 
sitting right up there with Social Security, Medicare, Civil Rights Act, health care for all Americans. Yeah. Health care for all Americans. This, as I said, we have made history, and now we are making progress for the American people. This would not have been possible without the leadership, the inspiration, the eloquence of President Barack Obama. But this was a big challenge, and it took all of our resources. It took you as an inspiration, the urgency that you see around you for health care reform in our country. It took our representatives to have the courage of their convictions to make the vote, to do as Jackie did on into the Congress of the United States, to bring her ideas, fresh thinking of this area, to think entrepreneurially about how we go forward so that we honor the vows of our nation. Our founders said in the Declaration of Independence that we are endowed by our Creator by certain unalienable rights. Life, liberty, and they said, the pursuit of happiness. Well, with the passage of this legislation, people will now have healthier lives, the liberty, the liberty and freedom to pursue their happiness. If you're a musician, singer, you want to be self-employed, follow your talent, your aspirations, your passion, you can do so now under this legislation. You no longer have to be job-locked into a job to have it. If, you, if you're a person who wants to start a small business, business. And by the way, we're talking about the creation of jobs. This is a job creator, four million jobs created by this bill. But we don't want just jobs. We want ownership. And that is what this bill enables people to do, to start a small business, because now they don't have to stay job locked in a job because it has health insurance. They can free themselves, start a business, follow their talents or they can change jobs without fearing that they will lose their health insurance. And if they happen to lose their job, they would not lose their health insurance. And so, think about an economy where people could have that freedom. It's not only good for them personally, for their talent and passion and aspirations, hopes and dreams, pursuit of happiness, it's about an economy that can have that kind of vitality. Other countries have it. It's not an issue there. Why should it be an issue here? And it has certain other, in addition to that aspect of it, as Jan said, it's about women. If you are a woman, no longer will, this bill's for you. No longer will being a woman be a pre-existing medical condition. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> according to some insurance companies if you, and policies, if you have children, if you can't have children, if you've had a C-section, you have a pre-existing condition. If you're a victim of domestic violence, you have a pre-existing medical condition. If you're an older woman, <laughs> this is an, all right, all right. <laughs> this is an important, this bill is for you. Because that is now all gone. No longer will the, any of those considerations prevent you from having health insurance. And no longer can families be denied health insurance because a child might have asthma or diabetes or be bipolar. No longer will that be the case. But let me tell you. Let me tell
tell you just two in this regard of pre-existing. One of my colleagues got a letter from a family, little boy, eight years old, eight years old, had a stroke. Thrown off the policy, of course, for the rest of his life, he will have had a pre-existing medical condition, unable to get health insurance or to afford the kind of health care that he needs. Until now. Until this bill. Until this bill. And a young woman whose letter I read um, on TV the other day, 23 years old, she died in January. Her mother wrote, wrote that when she graduated from college, she was thrown off her father's policy. And she was diabetic and insulin dependent, and so she tried to find a job. She couldn't get a job that provided health insurance, not even enough money did she make to cover her medical expenses. So she started, and her mother had five children, a single mom could help her only to a certain extent. So she started to cut back on her insulin, not taking the night dosage. And one morning in January, she just didn't wake up. That's over. That's over, according to the Under this legislation, children, if they're if their parents agree, and they agree, can stay on their parents' policies until they are 26 years old. To give them a start, a running start out of college. But you name it, so many families in America have a person in the family with a pre-existing condition. And that, again, they are then denied access to quality, affordable health care. That is coming to an end. So no longer can they deny you for pre-existing. No longer can they say, you paid for your health insurance all along. Now that you're sick, we're canceling your policy. No longer can they rescind your policy when you're practically on the way to the operating room and say, we found out that you smoked when you were a teenager and you didn't tell us that, so that was a pre-existing condition. The insurance companies have totally gotten out of hand. But this... So it's really important in this legislation to expand access to many more people. 32 million more people will have access. 32 million more people will have access to health care. It will be affordable to the middle class, which is important because accessibility has to have affordability with it, or else who can afford it? So accessibility for many more people, affordability for the middle class, accountability for the insurance company. Never again, never again can they come between the doctor and their patient. Very important. We've been playing on their turf for six, over six decades. It's time for the insurance company is to be playing on the turf of the consumer and the American people. So, the list goes on about what happens. There are primary care doctors uh, to be paid on a par, as, uh, Medicaid doctors on a par with Medicare doctors, so many primary care doctors will minister to those in the community health center. Vast expansion of access to uh, community health centers, which are the, the first line of defense in some of our communities uh, for meeting the needs of people, and we're very excited. But Jim Clyburn, and our whip, had this as a priority. Uh, and more and more about health care, which uh, you probably think I'm going to take all day to tell you about, but we're so proud of it. But what I want you also to know is that in this legislation, thanks to the leadership of Congressman George Miller, Chairman George Miller, Chairman of the Education Committee, there is a massive education piece, which President Obama will talk about on Tuesday when he signs the final version of the bill. And in that, we have expand, uh, an increase in what people who need Pell Grants can receive. So expansion of Pell Grants. Many more people, a bigger, a bigger grant. We will have reduction of interest for student loans. We'll have direct lending for kids who want to go to college and, and uh, need loans. But now we've taken away the middleman, take the money away from the banks, reduce the interest to the students, save money for the taxpayers. <laughs> 
much more funding for our community colleges where our kids can go for apprenticeships, job training, and all the rest. Community colleges fare very well in the legislature. And something that I'm particularly proud of because I've been working on it for years in the Appropriations Committee too, and that is two and a half billion dollars for minority serving institutions. Right. Historical black colleges, uh, 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 minor, uh, Hispanic serving institutions, black serving institutions, our tribal colleges for neighbor, uh, Native Americans to bring much, many more resources to these colleges so that they can in turn uh, compete for grants. They can in turn compete for grants. You know, um, Cecil and, and Jan have taught us over the years that every person in the Bible tells us so. We talked about our own founders and their vows of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and that we're all created equal. But the Bible has told us that uh, for thousands of years. And Jan and, and uh, Cecil, have, should I be calling you the Reverend, Reverend Williams? Cecil have also... This whole place, God Memorial, is predicated on the idea that there's a spark of divinity in every person, that, we all, that we're all God's children. And that we, therefore, are, are all worthy of respect. Amen. Are all worthy of respect. But that spark of divinity also gives us a responsibility, especially if God has given us the opportunity to serve to be public servants in the Congress of the United States, in the state legislature, in the Board of Supervisors, wherever it happens to be, that we have to say, not only do they have the spark of divinity and I must respect them, I have it too, and it carries a responsibility for me to do God's work. <laughs> on a number of occasions when I have spoken at celebrations and tributes uh, for God Memorial, we've talked about the Gospel of Matthew, and when I was hungry, you gave me, it goes on and on, and the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, who helped, who stopped to help somebody that he never knew. A stranger helping someone else. Not a neighbor, but a stranger. <laughs> but all, and so that's, you know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel, sometimes use words. Because what we have to do is by our actions, by our actions, preach that gospel. In the Old Testament, in one of the Psalms, it says, Know ye not that ye are gods? Yes. Say to each and every one of us. Yes. Not that we're gods, but that we have that within us. Yes. That we have that within us. So again, those of us who are blessed with the opportunity to be public servants, and I was raised to um, believe that the family, my father was the mayor, as was mentioned, the member of Congress when I was born, but mayor of my whole church childhood from when I was in first grade and when I went away to college he was still mayor and then my brother was mayor. But they taught, we lived in a neighborhood, Little Italy in Baltimore, Maryland. People would come to the door for jobs, for food, to get a bed in the city hospital, an a, a apartment in the projects. And we were taught that this was our, we had a responsibility to each other. To each other. And so um, when you talk about a Jackie Spear and the path that she took to the Congress. And when she got there, at, well, and through the legislature and the rest, and when she got there, uh, to come there to get this job done, why are we here but to do the work of the people? Yeah. Inspired by our great democracy and what we mean to our responsibility to each other, inspired by the Old and New Testament, the Koran, or any religious text that you follow or non-religious text that you follow that talks about the dignity and worth of every person. But just think now, 
coming back to this health care issue, what this means. It's not only just about health care. It's about a healthier America. It's about diet, not diabetes. It's about taking care of our children in a way that they will have access to care, not be put off until, until they have to go to an emergency room, but intervene into their particular health situation earlier. My parents, and I'm sure yours, have always said, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. We all salute each other, salute to your health, to your health, to your health, because it is essential to our strength, not only our individual strength, but the strength of our nation. So again, Jackie was there with issues that related to fairness, to, to um, uh, women's issues, of course, but also constantly talking about uh, infections in hospitals, this, the specifics of it. So that when we had, finally had a product, we knew what we had and we knew what we didn't have, but we knew what we were kicking the door open so that change we can believe in is here. And change that we can build upon is here. So there's much more that needs to be done. We know that. But again, the inspiration that each and every one of you is to us, how people work hard to meet their family's needs, however they define the term family, whatever that means to them. Whatever that means to them. It took so long because the special interest resisted this. They resisted it because of one reason. They've made a ton of money over time exploiting the needs of the people. They just did. I'm sad to say that. But again, for the people, we had, a great, we had a great victory. It was, again, we all felt very blessed to play some role in this as your representatives, doing what you would want us to do. And I always believed it would happen. People would say, well, when did you think it was going to happen? And when did you know? And I said, I always knew. I always knew, right Jackie? We always knew it would pass. We always knew it would pass. It could be harder or it could be easier. It could be sooner or it could be later. But it was going to pass because it was the right thing to do for our country. The opposition was out there and they still are misrepresenting what this does. But what it does in a very, very brilliant way, again, sowing the seeds and leading the way for more to be done, is to enable people to be who they want to be and not be pigeonholed or job locked because of health care. It enables our, we simply could not afford the status quo. The family budget, the federal budget couldn't, couldn't afford it. The economy couldn't afford the stagnation that happens when our, it's, met, its people cannot reach their fulfillment. Yeah. And our businesses cannot compete internationally with this big strain of cost of health care uh, on them uh, that is now, now they are freed from. So if you want to be self-employed, if you want to start a business, if you want to change jobs, if you want your children to know that they will be taken care of and you can take risks and be entrepreneurial. And again, it's not just about job creation, it's about equity and ownership. This job is a big economic package, it's a big education package, it's a big healthcare package. And I appreciate the opportunity to come home here to say to you all, thank you for being the inspiration that you are, thank you for the urging that you were for this for a very, very long time, Thank you for the delivery, uh, Jan and Cecil, of services in terms of health care and beyond. But again, let us recognize that without the election and the presidency of the president, this would not have happened. Let me tell you what he said, and I'll close with it. He said to me that after the vote, uh, I talked to him that night, but the next morning he called back and he said, I am happier, I was happier last night when the bill passed the House than I was the night I was elected president. Yeah. 
so like him would be happier about doing something for people than his own elevation to the presidency. But I said, well, Mr. President, I was very, very happy last night, but I wasn't happier than when you were elected president. <laughs> because when you were elected president, it, that made this victory possible for the American people. I want to acknowledge my husband, Paul Pelosi, who is here. I don't have my pool table yet. I, <laughs> I said if he doesn't give it to me for my birthday, I'm going to give it to him for his birthday. <laughs> but here's the thing. You hear these statistics. Forty-some million people without insurance. Now under this bill, we'll take care of over 30 million people. You hear the numbers of people who have been excluded, the number of people who die each year because they don't have health insurance. The numbers are all staggering, and they impress us. But we think of them one person at a time. And what this legislation means to each individual person and family and community to make our country stronger. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be there to lead the way. Yes, we can. Thank you, Glide Memorial, for everything. Madam, yeah. Madam, <laughs> Madam Speaker, we understand that you had a birthday, and we wanted the clinic staff, Karen and Pat, went out and got you a gift because of all you've done for our clinic. And we thought that this would be apropos. <laughs> <laughs> it's a blood pressure cuff. <laughs> because. We thought that maybe your Republican colleagues, some of them could use this. <laughs> as well as maybe some of the insurance <laughs> companies. <laughs> but happy I birthday. Have everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Would you like to stay up, though, uh, downstairs? No, go stay. Oh, okay. I'm staying. Right. Good. All Thank right. Thank you, Glide Memorial, for all, all right. that you are. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come on now, yeah.